Well, Ben. Can I call you Ben? No? Good. I'm calling you Ben anyway. <sighs> this is from your website. I'll leave a link below. Debating with a Skepsta. I came across this brilliant web page the other day, which put into words something that I've been thinking about for a long time. Okay, let's let's put this straight. Anyone who believes in these ridiculous things always has get-out clauses. They always build things in. They like to try and apply things that don't matter, make things change things around, do whatever they can, because at the end of the day, they've got no proof. And again, as Ben can't understand, he calls it as the sceptic movement. It's not even a movement, it's a state of phys um, philosophical position where you are not believing the claim that is being presented to you because they have not provided specific, you know, sufficient evidence to be able to support their claim. That is what a sceptic is, and it's not a, a the, as you call it, a sceptic or a sceptic spelt the American way, which is ridiculous. But anyway, we'll get into your point. Anyway, point one, raising the bar or impossible perfection. Uh, the trick consists of demanding a new, higher, more difficult standard of evidence uh, to look as if the sceptic's opponent is, uh, is going to satisfy an old one. Okay, we have standards of evidence in academia, science, history. They are, depending on way, what subject you are talking about, given this you are talking about psychic powers. Again, if you are going to present a load of anecdotal evidence, which is not even worth anything when it comes to satisfying any standard of evidence, then you can't fulfil your promise. What we are asking for is proper evidence, not someone who said, well, I saw a ghost yesterday. That's not good enough. And again, I'm sorry, you can't understand that. Your next one is two, shocking with Ockham. Uh, Skeptics frequently involve Ockham's razor, as if the razor automatically validates their position. Occam's Razor's principle of uh, knowledge theory, it states that the simplest explanation is often the best one. That's what Occam's Razor basically is. Basically, Occam's Razor is quite frankly the best use to take when you're a sceptic because the simplest explanation is often the most obvious one, if not the one. Because when people who like to claim they have psychic powers or get into conspiracy theories, then all of a sudden things start piling up. More and more evidence which they have to account for, and they cannot account for it. Hence, Arkham's Razor. The simple explanation is probably the most reasonable, and if not, the most likely one. That is Arkham's Razor. It is not some shock tactic. It is... A useful position to take that hey I'm not gonna believe I'm not believing your position because hey it could have worked out like this which is the more simpler explanation and not you know some fanciful one three extraordinary claiming this is fun extraordinary claims says the skeptic require extraordinary evidence Yes, we do. If you are making an extraordinary claim like psychic powers exist, then you need to prove that, well, psychic powers exist, and that is some extraordinary evidence you need to provide. Again, you are not providing the evidence that the scientific community, or even, you know, the sceptic movement, as you like to call it, is providing you. Sorry. Ah, stupid crazy liars. This consists of a simple slander. Well, guess what? Uh, you do this to everyone. <laughs> I've seen people make this claim, even in my last video. 
opened up with calling me, you know, a, a fathead. So, again, you can be nice to these people, but, you know, sooner or later you pull nerves on these people. And, yeah. He goes on to say about how um, the skeptics accused uh, the guy of not of not publishing results of a failed experiment. Uh, yes, you should always publish failed experiments, and failed experiments are being published all the time. Why? Because it's useful for scientific knowledge, because guess what? If a scientist wants to do a similar experiment, or if not the exact same experiment, then they will look for people who have failed, or maybe have produced different results and go, okay, that way fails, so I'm going to do it this way instead. That's not... That's not, you know, it's... That's not, you know... It's not hard. It really isn't. And even if he had produced, you know, failed experiments, then... Again, we'd cross that rat out with his results and say, okay, in this result you got this, but in this you did it this way, but you got this result. How come it failed the first time but succeeded the next time? It's more information. Again. Ah, the Santa Claus gambit. <laughs> the trick. The trick. You notice it's always a trick because, yeah, we're trying to fool you into or bamboozle you into something. It's not. We're just taking position that you haven't provided sufficient in evidence to validate your points. Uh, the trick consists of, moderate, of of lumping moderate claims or preposterous together uh, with extreme ones. If you suggest, for example, the Sasquatch can't completely be ruled out from all available evidence, the skeptic will then uh, fictitiously suggest that Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny can't be completely ruled out either. <sighs> I really don't have to explain that. I really shouldn't have to. Anyway, number six. Shifting the burden of evidence. The skeptics insist that he doesn't have to provide evidence and arguments to support his side of the argument because he isn't asserting a claim. That is very poorly worded. Basically, you're the ones making the claim. We're the ones taking the sceptic position of I want to see more evidence to your claim or where's your evidence is a very legitimate point and a very valid point to ask. Again, it's not the sceptic's position to prove you right. It's your position to prove you right. Hence, you have the burden of proof. It's you are the ones who are shifting the burden of proof onto the sceptic. It's not our job to prove you right. If you are making the claim, then you are the one that has to provide the proof that your claim is correct. Again, you've done this to me in the past, Ben. Remember when we were talking about chemtrails? You can't prove a negative. And you can't prove a negative. That's all we have to say, really. Number eight, the big lie. This is fun. The skeptic knows that most people will not have the time or inclination to check every claim he makes. Again, a skeptic is not someone who would make a claim. A skeptic is someone who is going... I do not believe um, you have provided specific, you know, sufficient evidence to prove your claim, or they are asking for evidence to prove that your claim is accurate and correct. A skeptic would not, you know, someone who is taking the skeptic position would not need to produce any evidence. Again, the burden of proof is on the person who makes the claim, not the skeptic. Doubt casting, wow. Again, Ben, go back to when we were talking about chemtrails and I was showing you all these links that disproved your chemtrails. 
and you were going, well, these are just, you know, CIA funded um, websites and you never proved any that they were doubtcasting. Yeah, you should see, be seeing now people that, you know, these are not people who are not academically honest and they don't have a single academic bone in their body despite what they like to claim and think. Ah, the sneer. <sighs> this gimmick is an invention, is an inversion of the stupid crazy liars. In the stupid crazy liars, the skeptic attacks the character and of those advocating asserting ideas and presenting information in the hopes of decreasing, of discrediting the information. Right, a skeptic would not need to do that. And if someone does that, which, you're, by the way, Ben, you have done yourself, so you are falling into the sneer gimmick. Um, so, you know, again, it's not, it's not us that have to provide evidence. It's you that has to provide evidence. And you, you are the ones that are making the claim and have to support your claim with evidence. You can't just go, well, psychic powers exist. The sceptic will then go, okay, well, where's your evidence? That is the sceptic position. You then have to provide evidence. Once you do provide evidence, the sceptic will then look over said evidence and then will basically make his judgment on the evidence you provide. And if the evidence is not sufficient or is wrong or is not or to a academic standard like, you know, it's anecdotal evidence, then it is still an entirely valid point to go, well, sorry, your evidence sisters isn't good enough. And again, these people will come up with lists like this time and time again because they need to have that warm, fuzzy thing to go when a sceptic comes along to them and says, well, what about this? They need to have that warm, fuzzy place where they can go, oh, point six, they're trying to shift the burden of evidence onto me. Or, oh, it's just the Santa Claus gambit. Pff, I don't have to respond to that. <sighs> Again, sorry Ben, that is weak sauce and it's not bad logic, you're the one with bad logic and in a debate setting, if you raised or tried to use any of these points, you would not only fail to gain any points from the judges, but you would probably lose points because again, you are asserting a claim and you are not willing to back it up with sufficient evidence. Sorry. Oh yeah, and by the way, what about this debate? I know you've said in the past you don't want to debate me, but a number of times there are clear points where we might have debated, but you know, I'd be very interested in debating you. I think it'd be quite fun, to be honest. <laughs> 